Hello, this is Paul Johnson with The Optimistic American. Now, even though we're optimistic, that doesn't mean that we don't recognize that there are problems or challenges out there. Today, we're going to talk with Professor Michael Beckley, who you might remember from the last season, spoke about his book, Unrivaled, where he talked about the United States being an unrivaled superpower, not just in the world today, but throughout all world history. He's written a new book, and it's called The Danger Zone. The Danger Zone is really about this narrative that exists on China today, how false it is. The, the, the narrative today promoted by many people is that China is on the upswing, the United States is on the downswing. That's just simply not true if you want to look at the data. However, China is beginning to recognize that their ability to be able to keep their economy growing is going to be limited. Their problems of geography, of a declining demographics, their problems with massive amounts of debt is putting them into a position where they're either going to have to become more imperial or a mercantilist, meaning they're going to have to force their goods upon other people. That's creating a split between us. Michael, uh, Professor Beckley is going to talk about not only that danger, the threat that exists, uh, how that could affect places like Taiwan, but how the United States should be responding to it. I think you'll like this show. Join us today on The Optimistic American with Professor, Professor Michael Beckley on, the, uh, on his new book, The Danger Zone. Professor Beckley, I'd like to welcome you back. We're excited uh, about talking about your new book. I loved your last book, but uh, welcome here to The Optimistic American. Thanks so much for having me back. All right, so I've got to start by asking this question. So uh, again, uh, you're, we're happy to have you back as a repeating guest. The last time we talked about your book, Unrivaled, uh, the interview went great. We had a lot of people who watched it, a lot of great comments. So I sent you out a bottle of whiskey, and I, I'm not sure if you decided that you were going to come back either because you wanted to talk about your new book, Danger Zone, or whether or not you were out of whiskey. I'm not sure which one I, it was. I still so. got some of the Laphroaig 10-year you sent me because that, um, that's a, definitely a sipping whiskey. Um, yeah. So I, my intentions here are pure. I just want to have a great discussion with you. There we go. All right. So here's my first question. I, I want to start almost where your book started. I think that the uh, the danger zone did a good job of laying out the arguments. But um, the first question that I have is there's this narrative that's going on in American politics today by lots of uh, different people. Uh, Ray Dalio is one of my favorites. I think he's brilliant. But he laid out in his new book almost kind of this this red wave that was going to wash over the United States because the United States is on the way down, China is on the way up. Um, you obviously see that differently, and, and specifically, you see that differently with China. I'd like to hear what it is that you see, what it is that you know that is such a different narrative than what we see going on in the mainstream uh, American politics today. Well, I think the Dalio and other similar theses are just that China is inevitably going to keep rising. And it's understandable why that narrative is very attractive to many people, just because China has been rising for so long. We tend to assume it's just a constant of the international system, just because it's been growing so fast since the late 1970s. But if you actually step back and look at the broad sweep of Chinese history, the last 40 years are an anomaly. And so we argue in the book that China's exceptional rise during this time has been the result of a few exceptional and now fleeting circumstances, all of which are rapidly turning against China and already dragging down its economy and resulting in strategic encirclement as well. All right. And the so talk, if you would, a little bit about peak China, what that means. Yeah. So peak China just means like from a growth perspective, you know, we've seen China's economies get slower and slower in terms of its growth rate and the quality of its economic growth has deteriorated. Now, you know, productivity has been negative for more than a decade now. So China's spending more and more to produce less and less. And we show that, you know, China used to have these tailwinds that was propelling its its rise, its economic rise, and obviously its military rise, but those are all turning into headwinds. So one was just basic security and engagement from the United States. You know, since the 1970s, the United States started fast tracking China's access to Western markets and capital. But now that's starting to reverse where we just saw this week, the Biden administration basically trying to cut China off from high end computer chips. China faces thousands of new trade and investment barriers today that it didn't face as recently as five years ago. So it's starting to lose some of that easy access uh, 
to the rest of the world. A second issue is just its population. So for the last uh, 30 years, China's had the greatest demographic dividend in history with something like 10 to 15 workers available to support every elderly retiree. This is largely a result of um, a huge baby boom in the 50s and 60s that was then followed up by a one-child policy in the late 1970s. So you had these baby boomers in the prime of their working lives with few kids to take care of and relatively few elderly parents to take care of. But now that's all going to start reversing because that baby boom generation is retiring and falling onto the backs of a tiny one-child generation. So that 10 to 15 to 1 ratio is going to collapse to 2 to 1 during the 2030s, between just over the next 10 years or so, China's going to lose 70 million working age adults and gain 130 million senior citizens. Um, and so it's just almost impossible to grow the economy like that. Um, there's also just, you know, China's running out of resources. It used to be self-sufficient in things like water, energy, food. Now it's the largest importer of food and energy and is suffering severe water scarcity. And that drives up the price of economic growth because raw materials are getting very expensive in China. And then lastly, you know, for a lot of the past 30 years, China's government was sort of evolving towards a smarter form of autocracy. You had lower level officials rewarded for good economic performance. But now under Xi Jinping, you know, his anti-corruption campaign has scared all the lower level officials from engaging in any kind of entrepreneurship. And he's shown time and again that he's willing to lock down, you know, big parts of the country if it enhances his political control. So the governance in China is also deteriorating. So we just look at these these tailwinds turn headwinds, and we see them already taking a big chunk out of China's rise. And we think they're all going to get worse um, in the coming years. And that just puts China in this potentially peaking position. Xi, um, I, you know, a lot of Americans had hoped that as they began to become uh, more of an open market and a free market, that demo uh, democratic principles might start to take place there. But it seems like we're we're witnessing quite the opposite. It seems like Xi is actually becoming more authoritarian as opposed to less. So he's clearly a dictator. And just this week, he's anointing himself dictator for life. I mean, even five years ago, he didn't appoint a successor as previous Chinese leaders um, had done during their reign. And he also stacked most of the highest decks of China's, um, of the Politburo uh, and the Politburo Standing Committee with cronies. And it looks like he's doing that again this week. So by all intents and purposes, you know, it's 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 similar to Russia in the sense that you have one leader that really enforces and lays down the policies. And what we've seen in, in Chinese history in the past is that when you have this lower level officials, the, the leader will set some ambitious target like zero COVID or we're going to produce more steel than Britain, you know, in the 1960s, uh, you know, as Mao did uh, with Khrushchev. And then everyone else just fall, is trying to meet that target one way or another, regardless of the costs for the nation as a whole. Because if you're a Communist Party official, your entire career and possibly even your life depends on doing what the dictator wants or telling him what he wants to hear. And so we're already seeing that 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 dynamic take place in, in China's governance um, today. And, and it's also being ma matched with this, sort of, I would argue, neo-totalitarian surveillance system that China has pioneered as well. Hundreds of millions of cameras all over the country, um, sort, you know, uh, artificial intelligence sorting through all those images, um, people being punished instantly by being cut off from WeChat, which is what, the, you know, this thing on your phone that Chinese people use for pretty much everything, you know, everything from ordering food to getting a bank loan to uh, when they travel, et cetera. And so you can just be cut off from that. So now this regime can punish citizens almost instantly and monitor everything that they do. Um, so it's really becoming a truly totalitarian state at this point. You know, it. it uh, I look back in American history uh, in the 1940s, at the 1945, most of the rest of the world had been destroyed, obviously, by the war. And so we created this grand bargain throughout the world that simply said, uh, look, we'll, we're willing to help patrol your shores. We're willing to give you access to our capital markets. We're willing to give you access to our local markets. But the trade-off was uh, that you had to help us oppose the, the rising threat of an authoritarian government at the time, the USSR. Um, we reached that agreement with China in 1972. We allowed them into our capital markets. We allowed them to sell products into the United States. That world order did an incredible amount to help their economy, to help them grow. It, in fact, 
I, I think it's almost astounding how fast that how fast they did grow. But it it seems to me that Xi now um, sees that as somehow or another as being a great benefit to Americans, as opposed to recognizing there was also a lot of great sacrifice that came from Americans to do that. The the cost to our taxpayers for the Navy, the cost to us in jobs for allowing uh, their product to be sold here. Now, we did gain some benefits. Products became cheaper, they became more abundant, they became more efficient. But I, I, I have the sense that G no longer really has a respect for the world order that's done so much benefit for him. Now, that's my narrative. What, what do you think his narrative is? I, I think that's exactly right. I think, you know, rising powers will usually rise peacefully when things are going great for them, because why would they want to upend the system that is fueling their ascent? But what we typically see is at a certain point, um, you know, rising powers, they, their economy starts to slow or they start to get encircled and they realize the system is no longer going to keep working for them. And what they usually do is try to re reorganize the system in a better way for them. And I think in China's case, a major turning point was um, in the mid 2000s and especially the 2008 financial crisis. So even prior to the crisis, Chinese leaders were worried that many of their industries were essentially becoming cogs in multinational uh, supply chains that were already dominated by big firms in the United States, Europe, and Japan, that they were just going to be stuck doing sort of export processing, you know, taking Apple and, uh, and all their, you know, uh, uh, fancy computer chips and uh, the screens and just kind of doing final assembly. And so they said, well, we need to march up the value chain and that might require us to engage in some fairly mercantilist practices. If we just let the free market reign, then we're going to be stuck um, as a low wage uh, production platform. And then when the 2008 financial crisis hit, um, you know, China had been dependent on selling exports into the American, European and Japanese markets. Those markets contract and demand for Chinese exports plummets, as well as countries just become more protectionist because they're trying to save their own economies. They're doing lots of stimulus spending, making their products more competitive and putting up protectionist barriers. And so the Chinese said, well, OK, well, clearly this is a turning point. Um, and if we, we can no longer rely on those markets, we may be shut out. We need to open up new markets and we have a tantalizing opportunity to do so because we're coming off of a 35 year epic bonanza of rapid growth. And now we have all of these geopolitical tools, economic tools, technological tools, military tools to actually reforge a new system. And so I think it's, it's, it's actually in 2009, even before Xi Jinping comes to power, the Hu Jintao administration sketches out this much more ambitious strategy. He says we have to actually actively promote and open up markets abroad. We have to fund um, critical strategic technologies that have both economic and military um, spillovers. And we no longer can count on good relations with the United States and its allies. And we've seen China chart out a much more assertive mercantilist posture ever since. It's manifested in things like Belt and Road, uh, China's military buildup, but you really see this transition once the Chinese start to doubt that the global liberal order that had helped their economic rise was going to work for them. And they are always threatened by the democratic aspects of that order. It's just that they are willing to sort of pay lip service to human rights or at least kind of, um, you know, uh, tread softly as long as the economic factors were working for them. As soon as those economic factors didn't seem to be working out anymore, they charted off on a different course. So, um, the starting premise that I saw in your book is that China really isn't an 80-year threat. That China has probably a limited horizon until they start seeing significant economic problems that are going to be massive setbacks for them. And that's beginning to change their strategy. That's right. Well, I, I think it's, it could change their strategy because if they, if they look ahead, they say right now um, on, in a number of areas, whether it's in the Taiwan Strait, or whether it's in uh, re, re, uh, writing the global trade rules, or whether it's um, beating back the frontiers of democracy and trying to shore up and make the world more safe for autocratic forms of government. Right now, we have an opportunity because in all of these areas, we're coming off of a recent era of a rapid rise. And so we have all these new capabilities. But you know the headwinds that we talked about um, a few minutes ago, they, they also recognize that they face those. And so they have to score near-term victories to alter those long-term trends. Otherwise, they're going to be condemned to a future of economic stagnation and geopolitical encirclement. They have to use the iron fist of state power to kind of batter their way. They can't just rely on the invisible hand of the free market. And so they so what we worry about is that 
they could do what previous great powers in their position did, which was to rush through near-term windows of opportunity in order to forestall or, or reverse a potential long-term window of vulnerability from opening wide. And um, we worry most about this in the Taiwan Strait, but there's other scenarios for where this could take place. Yeah, Professor Robinson, who wrote the book, Why Nations Fail, had this theory that part of what led to the success or failure of governments was whether or not they had extractive policies, whether they were extractive to their own people or for that matter to other people. It seems to me that what China has made a decision on is to utilize those powers to either become more of an imperial government or at least a mercantilist government, that they that they force their exports on other people and that they try to do that within the next decade to try to increase their power. Meaning they see their, you know, this is not a strategy that was lost on Hitler or Mussolini or a number of other people, which is when when you can't get the growth that you want to get from home, start taking over ever, other territories and extract the wealth from them. Yeah, the ironic thing is this was Lenin's th famous theory of, in, of capitalist imperialism. Lenin said that the problem with capitalism is at a certain point you've, you've, you've uh, paved all the roads in your country, you've built all the bridges that are really valuable, and uh, your population can only absorb so much of your economic production. And at a certain point, you just have a ton of surplus and there's just diminishing returns. There's no more greenfield investment opportunities at home. And he said this inevitably drives capitalist countries into imperialism and ultimately into war because all the different capitalist countries will be doing this at the same time and they'll collide with each other. The, the great irony, of course, is that it's now communist China who is suffering from these excess capacity problems. And the Belt and Road Initiative is a direct uh, response to that. So the Chinese, Chinese leaders in the late 2000s and early 2010s realized they were sort of choking on a surplus that they'd already paved most of the useful roads. And so they said, we need to stimulate new markets abroad, especially in developing countries, because the rich democracies are starting to turn against us. And so what they've done since that time is loan out more than a trillion dollars, mostly to, to developing countries who have taken that money and then used it to employ Chinese companies uh, and Chinese workers to install Chinese telecommunication systems or smart city systems, as the Chinese call them, um, and to build infrastructure there. And so it creates steady demand for Chinese companies and also, of course, creates political influence because now those countries are, are hooked on Chinese finance. They are, they are in debt to China and they are dependent on its ecosystem of technologies and services and goods. And there's been already instances where countries have asked China to cancel some of these Belt and Road projects because it may bankrupt their country. And the Chinese have made very clear that if you do that, you're going to lose access to Chinese money, you may lose access to China's market. Uh, you're going to have face the cancellation of several other major projects in your country, and so you already see this coercive neo-imperialistic model being applied. And the, the great irony is that Vladimir Lenin predicted this, um, you know, a century ago. The uh, at some point in time that debt comes due, and at some point in time there are going to be defaults on at least some portion of that debt. Uh, I assume that starts to to weigh heavier on a system in China that is um, that has not only been lending out a lot of money, but that have been growing their own monetary supply by significant portions. Yeah, this is a, a huge um, challenge that China will face in probably seven to 10 years from now when many of these loans will come due. Because obviously everyone loves you when you're handing out money, but debt collection is a very nasty business. And the Chinese government itself has estimated that roughly half of the loans it's dispersed already under Belt and Road are not going to be paid back. And so then in you know in seven to 10 years from now, China, the Chinese government's going to face a decision. Do you uh, extend or roll over those loans or just write them off the way that many Western banks did after the 1980s third world debt crisis? Or do you seize collateral you know, from partner nations? You take over a port or you take over um, you know, a, a mine or something there to, to try to get some money back. Um, you know, if, if you write the loans off, you then have to explain to the Chinese people why you sank hundreds of billions of dollars into loss making projects in poor countries when China itself, you know, is a relatively poor country. But if you start seizing assets um, or getting coercive, then that's not a great way to win hearts and minds. And so China could face blowback of the kind we're already seeing in Sri Lanka, for example, where people were just so angry at the corrupt government there for uh, immiserating the country to fatten their own pockets on um, airports that aren't being used, on ports that are severely under capacity, et cetera.
All right. So you lay out very well on your book, and I think you've done a good job here of the the challenges that China's going to face long term. But short term, the t- whole title of your book, The Danger Zone, is that there's a period of time that that is going to be more dangerous than it may be in the future. Can you talk about that concept for a moment? Yeah. So the idea is just that we, you know, we don't expect China's not going anywhere. We don't think that China's going to somehow implode, but that because it's at the peak of it's coming off this this uh, uh, rapid growth period, um, and because the United States in various areas has been pretty slow to get its act together, uh, whether militarily or or technologically, is now trying to make up for lost time. There are these windows of opportunity for China to potentially rush through that could potentially, uh, you know, rekindle China's rise in various ways and change those long-term trends. And so we make a loose analogy to the early stages of the Cold War, where American policymakers then were pretty confident that communism ultimately would prove bankrupt, but they knew that to win the long-term Cold War, you had to not lose short-term battles, uh, whether that means protecting Europe or or making sure that you're ahead in certain key technologies. And we think that loosely applies today. There's a number of areas where if China were to master AI, you know, before the United States does, that could rejigger re, uh, the uh, international trends. Or if China is somehow able to conquer Taiwan and, and, and thrashes the U.S. military in the process of doing that, then, you know, that, that upends these long-term trends that we've sketched out that assume a peacetime sort of steady uh, working of international machinery. So we, we just really argue that the United States has to be extra vigilant as much as it needs a long-term China strategy. It also needs a short-term one focused on this decade to blunt what we worry could be a surge of Chinese aggression. So you talked about uh, some, of the, um, some of what we've read out of China. I believe that uh, you had spoken about this, that their strategy uh, is looking at not just trying to uh, go after Taiwan, if in fact they were to go after Taiwan, but it is to make certain that they obliterate the United States Navy that's there in the process. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, there's several, several different scenarios for how China, if it decided to use military options in Taiwan, could go about it. Obviously, the one we worry most about, because it's really the only one that would guarantee China the ability to actually take control of Taiwan, is a full-scale um, assault and an invasion of of Taiwan because things like blockades. I mean, you're that's going to be a long term. That that could take months or even years, and and they don't really have a great historical record. But an invasion, you know, if you can conquer the territory, then you have it. And what the what Chinese military writings that we cite have been talking about for for more, for decades at this point is that the only way to win that war is you have to cripple the Americans from the start because if they if they if you leave American forces, especially the big bases on Okinawa intact, the United States will do what they did to the Iraqis, you know, in the 90s, in in 1990, 1991, they'll build a giant iron mountain of military capabilities, and then they'll just massacre you. And so you have to disrupt their ability to uh, staging locations. Um, And the United States is very vulnerable because it's fighting thousands of miles from its home territory. And so has most of its big military eggs concentrated in just a few baskets, the two bases on Okinawa, which are the only ones within 500 miles of Taiwan, and then big aircraft carriers that China has made a concerted effort to develop missiles that could wipe those out. So even though the U.S. still has a very powerful military, it has these key vulnerabilities, and China has zeroed in on them. And that's why we just worry, you know, it's not, what we worry most about in the Russia-Ukraine scenario is like direct fighting between Russian and American forces. We worry that could be the outcome from from the opening minutes of a war over Taiwan, because uh, Chinese military doctrine has contingencies where they would actually carry out a preemptive strike on um, on the bases on Okinawa and possibly even Guam too. So uh, let's be clear, you're not abandoning the principles that you laid out in Unrivaled, which is that the United States is still an unrivaled superpower and that economically we have a great future going forward. But what you are saying is that there is a very large short-term vulnerability that the United States has by not being prepared for the type of war that uh, China might bring in a place like Taiwan. Yeah, I think there's two key points. One is that, you know, the the overall balance of power is still very favorable to the United States, and it's probably going to get even more favorable just given demographic trends and all the other problems that China faces. But there are local balances of power where China has made inroads, in particular in the Taiwan Strait, because there China has home field advantage. It's only 100 miles uh, 
away. And so the U.S. military is sort of fighting with one arm or maybe even more tied behind its back. And also just the nature of technology makes it very easy for, as we're seeing in Ukraine, for even weaker forces to pulverize large massed forces of the kind the United States would need to assemble to potentially repel a Chinese assault. So there's that. But then there's also just um, the, the, the trends themselves, just that even if in the long term, the U.S. is probably going to uh, continue to stay way ahead of China, there are these short term um, um, moments. And it's precisely because China is weaker than many of us think that it's actually could be more dangerous than many of us think, at least in the short term. So um, talk to me about what you think that we are doing to try to counter those threats. And then maybe more importantly, follow up with what do you think we should be doing? So in in terms of military uh operations there's there's a lot of um a lot of solid talk about new strategies for both the united states and taiwan both countries have come up with ambitious plans to basically revamp their military posture by the early 2030s so that you, you basically spread out your forces so that you don't concentrate all those eggs in a, in a very small number of baskets and you just flood the area with lots of sensors and shooters that basically functions like a high-tech minefield so that if china has tries an invasion or if it tries to stage a blockade, those forces, those massed forces would get picked apart in a similar way to Russia's forces getting ground down by Ukrainians running around with, you know, RPGs and with other small precision guided munitions. So that's the basic idea. I think it's a sound one. It's one that defense experts have been talking about for more than a decade, but trying to now implement that, of course, is a much slower proposition because it forces the United States and Taiwan basically fight in a very different way than what they've been preparing for for the last 30 years. They used to just rely on their technological superiority, big fancy platforms, aircraft carriers, uh, F-16s in Taiwan's case, uh, F-35s in Americans' case, but those are all extremely vulnerable. Now we're talking about like literally strapping missile launchers onto barges and just having lots of them all over the place. And so even if some get wiped out, you still have lots of other shooters that could um, take out a Chinese um, invasion force. So there's a lot of talk, but it, I, the direction of travel is the right one, but the speed is lacking. And what I worry is that the United States is also provoking China with a lot of tough talk over Taiwan, you know, saying Biden saying we will definitely defend it. And there's legislation on Capitol Hill that would upgrade Taiwan's relationship with the United States. That's all very provocative. And I'm just worried we're talking loudly before we've had a chance to really build the big stick we would need to deter China militarily. And so if you would talk about, uh, um, I, I want to go more into this whole concept of the vulnerability of an aircraft carrier. I like the analogy that you gave that we've given Ukraine technology that's helped them undermine a huge, uh, larger, superior force. But um, our aircraft carriers being in danger, help me understand that better. So China has an array of forces it's built up over the last 20 years that could potentially sink American aircraft carriers. One, the most uh, um, uh, amazing one are these, um, uh, their, their uh, ballistic missiles that fly way up in outer space and they come down and then they start acting more like cruise missiles and they can potentially target a moving aircraft carrier. So China has developed ballistic missiles that they could just launch from the Chinese mainland that could potentially hit an aircraft carrier. They also have expanded their submarine force. And when, you know, once you get close to China's shores, uh, China has all these diesel powered submarines that run, you know, they go on electric power basically when they're in combat mode. And so they're extremely quiet and hard to detect. And they could obviously fire on um, aircraft carriers. And then China also has churned out warships and combat aircraft at a rate we haven't seen from any country since World War II. And so it just has all of these potential vectors of fire that they could rain down on an aircraft carrier that, you know, can only go so fast in those waters takes a long time to turn around and concentrates an amazing amount of lives and firepower in this one giant bucket. Um, and so it's just, it's just become incredibly vulnerable. What's the alternative for Americans other than an aircraft carrier that's carrying lots of airplanes and supplies and being able to provide the fleet with what it needs? So one is um, the high tech version is the, is focused on submarines. So the United States has extremely advanced nuclear powered submarines that can stay submerged for, for months on end. Um, and, and they have a lot of, you can, you can pack a lot of missiles into them. And so China would have extreme difficulty trying to track those. And so you'd have persistent fire, mobile firepower. 
um, pretty much anywhere you want it, but they're also extremely expensive to build and they're hard to ramp up in the short term. What other folks have talked about and what the Navy calls distributed lethality is basically just putting missile launchers on anything that floats or flies. So I mentioned barges before, big cargo planes, and these could all be queued remotely through various uh, sensors. Now you need to have a lot of sensors floating and flying around as well, because China's probably going to target American satellites and whatever sensors they can they can find. And so you need this distributed net of, um, of munitions uh, loitering around. And then different services, like the Marines are developing doctrines where they can hop from, you know, there's all these small islands in the Western Pacific. And so they can hop from island to island and then use land-based uh, missiles and, and drones uh, to also bring more firepower into the theater. But basically, you know, it's it's ironic that in a high-tech age, there's this now premium put on quantity. You know, you can use lots of relatively inexpensive drones and cruise missiles um, to really create tremendous firepower. And at the end of the day, the U.S. has an advantage in that China, to accomplish its aims, whether it's taking Taiwan or turning the South China Sea into a Chinese lake, is going to have to mass its forces at some point. It can't really accomplish these things with a distributed force, and that will make Chinese forces very vulnerable. So you're almost taking China's playbook for how they fended off the U.S. Navy away from their coastline and helping China's neighbors acquire those same capabilities to fend off China away from their coastlines. Um, you're, you're, you're reversing it on them. That's, that's the basic idea. All right. So all of this leads us kind of back to the concept of the as China begins to become more aggressive, as other people begin to recognize they're going to be more aggressive, it also creates more problems for China. Um, the short term, I think you're right. Over the next, the question will be not only can we uh, deal with China long term, but can we put together the forces that we need and the strategy that we need fast enough to be able to hold them off. But again, as they're doing this, they're creating a problem for themselves. You had spoken historically about the concept of encirclement. I like the concepts that you'd laid out about what had happened with uh, Germany during, uh, I think it was World War I. But can you talk about that concept of encirclement and, and the challenges that it will create for China long term? Yeah, I mean, one problem with being a rising power is you start to scare people around you just because they see the rise in your economic and military power. And usually rising powers start expanding their influence um, in various ways. And so other countries will be a bit alarmed by that. And so they have incentives to balance against that rising power. Now, there are ways to forestall that. You know, China basically tried this in the 90s and 2000s, practicing friendship, diplomacy and settling territorial disputes and selectively opening parts of its um, economy to try to uh, prevent any kind of encirclement. But you know, what we've seen historically um, is that usually it's a sequence where the rising power realizes its rise is not going to last forever and it's starting to encounter various headwinds. And then it has to get more aggressive and assertive to try to beat back those trends. And then in doing so, triggers the kind of encirclement that ultimately ends up crushing the rising power. Now, the Chinese are very smart. Um, you know, they clearly recognize that that is an issue, but I think they also worry that there's there's just not a lot that they can do about it. And with something like Taiwan, I just don't think there's a lot of convincing Xi Jinping to go back and just be friendly to the Taiwanese and, and take a sort of laissez-faire approach to, you know, pursuing reunification over the next hundred years or something like that. I mean, he seems pretty determined to make China whole again, to conquer what he regards as a renegade province and bring it back into the fold. And so sometimes what these these powers do is they they're not even acting because they they think that this um, this aggressive move is going to benefit them. It's more preventing worse things from happening in the future. So Germany launches World War I uh, largely because it was worried about getting crushed by uh, Russia and France with an assist from Britain. Uh, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, not because they thought wonderful things would, would happen, but they just worried that if they didn't try to take on the US and get a sucker punch in early, that the long-term trends were just gonna choke out their empire in, in Asia. And so, um, and you even see it in China's history. Why does China fight the United States in the Korean War five years after the U.S. has just dropped nuclear weapons on Japan and is at the height of its power? Well, Mao worried that if the Americans conquered the Korean Peninsula and set up military bases there, it'd be even more of a threat in the future. And so this is why these peaking power dynamics are so scary, because a country that recognizes that it's encir causing its own encirclement, uh, 
may not have it feel that it has any other option but to sort of batter its way through and try to break the ring rather than trying to make nice with everyone around them. It's interesting, you know, when I think about Japan, the the uh, the example that you used. You're right. Japan during World War One, I, I think, was feeling or World War Two, excuse me, was feeling that encirclement and felt like they needed to sucker punch their way out. But yet when they ended up becoming a part of this world order that arguably Americans created, they benefited from it tremendously. And they didn't try to sucker punch their way out of it the second time. They just, uh, because you could have argued in the 1970s and 1980s that when they were accomplishing great economic success, that they might have been worried about the United States trying to put a damper on that as well. It's not what happened, which says to me that Americans really aren't going to try to put a damper on your ability to succeed economically, so long as you buy into that order that you have a that you need to be respectful of other people's borders, and we want you to be respectful of human rights, that we care about democracy and people's ability to help determine their own destiny. We were willing to allow China to move at a slow pace. I don't think we were trying to force them into anything quicker. In fact, I think there were a lot of Americans that were very supportive of what was happening in China. But China, I think, is that encirclement issue has moved a lot of their supporters into the detractor columns, both internationally as well as here at home in the United States. Yeah, I'm glad you you brought that up because, you know, I think um, some people might be tempted to say, well, why can't you just extend the same kind of olive branches that the United States did to Japan and China will become a responsible or at least a reluctant stakeholder in the existing order. And that's that's honestly what the United States tried to do, you know, from the late Cold War up until I would say the 2010s. But there's a couple of differences that I think make all the difference. One, I mean, aside from the fact that Japan had suffered total defeat in World War II and the horrible memory of that, you know, convinced the big part of the Japanese population to try a different um, route. But another is that, that you had a common enemy, obviously, with the Soviet Union. So both Germany and Japan were very afraid of the Soviet Union. And so they were much more willing to tolerate an American military occupation on their territory, the enforcement of a democratic regime on their on their people and to be folded into this liberal order. China and the United States don't have some overarching common enemy that can bring them uh, together as it did in the latter part of the Cold War. Another issue is just that as democracies, Japan and Germany um, were were much more, their systems were much more symbiotic with the kind of liberal order that the United States was trying to build. For the Chinese, they've always worried that, and, and it's just true that the Americans were using economic openness with the idea of changing China over time. I mean, Bill Clinton sa is said in Beijing when he visited there that uh, authoritarian regimes were on the wrong side of, of history. And so the Americans were explicit. And there's amazing Chinese documents, even in the Jiang Zemin era when relations were at their peak in the 90s, where he's telling his, his comrades, don't be fooled by what the Americans are saying. Clinton just told me they want to engage us, but whether they call it an engagement policy or a containment policy, it's all designed to change us, to change our regime, namely make turn us into a democracy. And that would mean the Communist Party, they're losing their tight grip on power. And that's not something they ever want to countenance. And they feel like they ran a natural experiment in 1989. So the Soviets and the Chinese both faced the kind of popular uprisings you were seeing in communist nations um, in, in Eastern Europe. The Soviets under Gorbachev you know, tried to make nice with the Americans. Gorbachev tried to reform and, and slightly open up. The Chinese sent in tanks into Tiananmen Square and guess who is still standing today? You know, Xi Jinping has said multiple times you know, that he, he's basically portrayed himself as the anti-Gorbachev. Like whatever Gorbachev would do, I'm gonna do the opposite because we saw how that ended catastrophically for the Soviet Union, and we're certainly not going to do that today. So I think just the difference in regime type, the lack of a common enemy, and then obviously you're not coming off of uh, the greatest, the biggest war in history where you know uh, uh, China has been you know defeated the way that Japan was. So it's just that bargain is just not going to work anymore. All right. So a lot of the questions that I've asked, I obviously know the answers to because I've read both of your books. In fact, I've studied both of your books. I think they really are outstanding. Um, Here's a question that I don't know how you'll answer. You put a lot of stock in geography. You, you give the United States the advantage because we have a far superior geography to, uh, to China and to Russia. Uh, demographics, you play a lot into demographics and the important role that that plays. Um, you certainly lay out a lot of statistical advantages that the United States has, both in terms of 
advantages that we have in our universities, in our uh, scientific discovery, the advantages that we have uh, in our companies. I'm interested to know whether or not you believe that there's an advantage to the United States in having a democracy over an authoritarian government. Or is the authoritarian government, the fact that they can have one person making a decision, uh, an advantage in your mind over the democratic system? In, in theory, uh, a um, benevolent dictator would be the best form of government, because then, just like you said, you can get things done. And if you had someone really smart and really nice at the top, um, then that would probably lead the country into better outcomes. But you know, like Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others. And I, I, I just think that that's fundamentally true. The problem is uh, benevolent, brilliant dictators um, are, are like unicorns, you know, <laughs> like they exist in theory, but not so much uh, in, in practice. And, and I think with, with Xi Jinping, um, you know, because po absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. I mean, all and any cliche you can come up with just seems to apply very much to the great power dictatorships that uh, that we're witnessing today and and in in the modern era. That they um, because they are purging rivals, because they are paranoid about the stab in the back, because in many cases that's how they had to come to power. They um, it suppresses the free flow of information, which then leads to really bad decision making. We're seeing that play out in Ukraine today, where I'm sure Putin and his his cronies were probably telling them, yeah, you, you could conquer the country in three days. It's going to be easy. And now look what's what's happened. And I worry that Xi Jinping, who has killed more messengers than than any other modern uh, leader in terms of purging people within the Chinese Communist political party, is probably surrounded by people that are afraid to question his judgment. I think you're seeing that playing out with the zero COVID uh, never ending zero COVID um, policy. So democracy has tons of problems and it's an incredibly inefficient way to govern the country, but it has all of these um, buffers that prevent some uh, poorly informed dictator from running the entire country into the ground. And so your, your failures tend to be not as big, or if you do have big failures, there's at least the possibility for debate and recovery. Whereas in a dictatorship, you know, the dictator always has to be right and is going to enforce that and everyone around him is going to play along and never point out that the emperor has no clothes. And we've just seen that so many disasters, some of the worst disasters um, stem in part from from that extreme concentration of power. It seems to me that this whole narrative that somehow or another a isolated dictator could be better because he's not driven by politics on its face is wrong. It seems to me like he's very driven by politics and it's the politics of avoiding idle hands in his country. He, I, it, it seems to me in looking at China, they spend a tremendous amount of time trying to make certain that they don't end up getting into a position where the economic progress that they've had begins to slow and the, uh, the politics of the Yuan people turn against them. Well, I, I think I would add that the priority seems to be political control because there's many, there's, you know, China, the World Bank, China partnered with the World Bank and asked for a report on the reforms they should use back in 2013. And the World Bank, of course, said things like you should open up more space for entrepreneurs and stop channeling 80% of your subsidies to state-owned enterprises. And um, you should, uh, you know, get, make it easier to have basically property rights so that people have an incentive to innovate and to set up new businesses. Um, and China, you know, the Chinese tinkered with it and then decided not to implement the vast majority of those reforms. And under Xi Jinping, you've just seen an even more extreme centralization of control, what they call macro control over the economy, um, where the party has just reasserted itself. I mean, any company with more than 50 employees has to have a party member on staff basically acting wow. as a political commissar. Again, the, the subsidies are largely channeled to state connected um, firms and negative economic news has been essentially outlawed at this point. And you saw with the, the regulations on various industries, internet companies, you know, Alibaba, Jack Ma, because he, he, he ran his mouth a little bit too much, uh, was disappeared for a few months and then had his empire sliced in half and doled out. Um, and you've seen that with other tech firms too, where they've just been put under enormous regulations um, that have really crippled the dynamism of their firms. And you say, well, that doesn't make any sense if you're trying to grow the economy. But I think that reflects the fact that the priority for the Communist Party is political control above all else. Everything else is just an adjunct. And they even released a national security 
strategy in 2014 that explicitly said that. It said the prime directive is keeping the party in power. Anything else is just an adjunct to making sure that we achieve that um, that objective. Yeah, the uh, when you you know I, I saw about two weeks ago China had made a decision to take these companies who had begun to leave China and to sequester or to take their property, which of course means that the lenders who lent money on those properties are now going to be in default and they're not going to be able to get repaid back on their loan unless the company guaranteed it individually. Well, the result of that is that they're going to get less capital that flows into their country. We had uh, past Treasury Secretary Summers on our show and he said, look, the, the winning country is usually the place where labor and capital wants to go to. And in both of those cases, it seems like the opposite is beginning to happen in China. Yeah, I mean, it's. I, I think it's happening slower than I would have guessed because in the last few years, you had a lot of Wall Street money pouring into China because I think at the end of the day, there's always going to be the lure of the China market, just given how big it is. The idea that this is the by far the largest pool of untapped financial savings that could be used for all kinds of uh, all kinds of deals and just the size of the potential consumer market there. And so you've seen a lot of investment. But I, I actually, when I advise investors, I say you have to be very careful because there's not only geopolitical and political risk, as we we talked about, you have to worry you're going to get squeezed from the American side as well. You need to pay attention to what's going on on Capitol Hill because there is more and more talk um, of, of trying to achieve decoupling in key areas, including cutting off the money that could flow to Chinese companies that are linked to either the military or the surveillance state. And we've seen with Biden's um, controls on, on computer chips that at this point, the administration seems like they're going to have more blanket kind of, you know, because we can't always play whack-a-mole with all these um, bad Chinese entities. We just have to cut uh, commerce off between the United States and China in important strategic um, areas. So, you know, you have that. And then you also have the zero COVID factor. And, I, you know, the, the more investors I talk to, this has actually played a major role just because if you're the CEO of a company, how do you know what's going on? in your China operations, you know, because when you fly into the country, you can't just go around and look, you have to sit in a hotel for several weeks on your way in and way out and you may your movements going to be restricted. So I think that also has put a damper and you, you, it will drive down uh, cross border investment. But that that process has been actually much slower than I would have guessed maybe four or five years ago. But it seems like it's yeah. we're reaching a tipping point now. Oh, I think it's reaching a tipping point because uh, whether we know it or not, I think we are in a Cold War. And I think we won the last Cold War by building a set of alliances around the world. We built a set of alliance based upon giving people uh, naval protection for their trade. We built it based upon rebuilding their countries, but we also built it by giving them access to our markets. This time, there's a bigger market. In that particular period of time, the entire world market was destroyed other than ours. But I think to be able to participate, you are going to increasingly find the United States is going to take the position, you got to pick a side. Uh, because unfortunately, at least the narrative that, that I'm hearing out of China is they want to disassemble this order. Now, that American order that we think existed, again, I don't believe that that happened. It, we, there were some benefits that came to us, but it also came with great American sacrifice. We gave up a lot in that process. All right, so here's a question I want to ask you also that kind of isn't in your books. I, you know, I got a little bit about you personally last time. I heard what happened to your family, uh, a proud Japanese family, how some of them were put into the different camps, the, the stresses that they faced from that. And yet you seem to be an incredibly patriotic person. The, you're, you know, I, I, I believe that a lot of what you have spoken about and Unrivaled was driven by data, it was driven by what you were seeing scientifically, but I also have the sense that there is some strong patriotism inside of you, that you do uh, believe in who we are. Can you talk about that for a little bit? I'd love to know what your thinking is on that. Is it all data driven or is some of it emotionally attached? Uh, and I guess in terms of patriotism, it's the vast majority is is emotional um, and just um, being grateful to to live in this country. Sometimes I just think I can't believe I was born into this country at this time, because I think just the more you travel around the world and you study the world and you study history, you, you become much more grateful of um, the kind of prosperity um, and freedoms that you enjoy in the United States, despite all of its 
faults. And it's not just me, you know, I, I, I think a big influence was actually my relatives, like my grandparents who, who were interned during World War II. And while my grandmother's brothers, you know, volunteered to fight for the U.S. Uh, Army and, and one of them is killed in action and another is gravely wounded. Um, and when they, you know, when, when uh, the two brothers that survived come back, they were very patriotic, despite the horrible racial injustice that they suffered, not just with what happened to their family during the war, but when they came back, I mean, one of the brothers said, you know, he had just come back, he had a purple heart, he had fought in the most decorated American military unit in, in US history. And he goes to a hotel and the lady asks him, are you Chinese? And he says, no, I'm Japanese. And she's like, well, we don't serve Japs here, you know? So he had to come back to that wow. kind of environment. And even he was like, this is the greatest country on earth, despite the flaws, despite the kind of injustice that we, our specific population is suffering. It's the only country that it, 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 a, democrat, a democratic system at least allows for the possibility of exposing and reforming those injustices. And there are also bigger battles to fight that when you, yes, there are terrible things going on in the United States, but it's not Nazi Germany. You know, it's not Imperial Japan. It's not the Soviet Union. And so sometimes you have to band together and put um, various grievances at home aside to, to focus on, on the greater potential threat. Yeah, I, I grew, you know, I'm, I, I feel very fortunate for my life and the things that have happened with me, but I grew up in a pretty poor neighborhood. Um, the, you know, when I look at our country, I, I'm not sure that there's any data that surrounds us, but the, the government has done a great many good things. I've been involved in government. I've seen the bridges they've built and the roads that they've built, and we put people on the moon, and we have fire departments and police departments and schools. But I really do believe that while we have had unbelievable luck on geography, our demographics are really good, the, the fundamentals are good of, in our country, I think for me the, the, the big difference that our government made was that it empowered the individual over itself. And that concept has evolved over time. I mean, in the beginning, we know that when people said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they really only meant men, and they probably only meant property owners, and it certainly was only white. But that concept over time has grown and it's evolved. We, we shouldn't lose the fact that at that point in time, they were taking on the world's largest government, and they weren't looking to create a perfect government. They just wanted to create a more perfect one than the one that they were leaving. Over time, we saw suffrage movement. We saw the civil rights movements. We've seen the equal rights movement. And the more people that could participate in the economy, the greater it became, the bigger it became, the more producers and the more consumers that we had. But, but what's hard to, to compare us to a China, in China, we know who their political leaders are, and their political leaders are almost everything. In the United States, arguably, the private sector leaders are as big or bigger than the public sector leaders. You know, you could argue we don't have great leadership in this country, although I did like uh, in your book how you kind of gave Trump credit for being willing to take on the China issue, even though you... You, uh, you took a little bit back from him. I'm not a Trump fan, but that's unimportant. You, you took some back from him by saying that, you know, it would have been great if we would have been more strategic in it. You were much less partisan and political. But whether it's Joe Biden or Donald Trump, who you could argue whether or not they're good or bad leaders, we have some great leaders in the private sector from Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Elon Musk. Uh, Warren Buffett, people who are doing amazing, unbelievable things. And for me, that's the hope that I have for this country. I see that this whole private sector side that's outside of government, that's empowered by government to be able to think separately, has created an unbelievable set of optimism for us because we spread out the power curve. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... I, I share some of your your optimism. I think the the pessimism is just how fragile this kind of system is. I mean, there aren't that many examples, especially um, you know a, a, a liberal multi ethnic democracy where you have tremendous demographic change. That's that's just difficult to to manage. And the the principles of the country obviously are universal. And like I'm 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 biracial. I'm a direct uh, I'm, I'm like a walking piece of the melting pot. And so, you know, it's this wonderful idea that we're not a country that's founded on blood and soil here. It's it's about principles that anyone can subscribe to. But the, the difficulty, obviously, is 
I think humans just naturally, um, you know, uh, form in groups and out groups. You know, they define themselves against some other. They're a Democrat, I'm a, uh, and I'm against that, so I'm a Republican. Or they're of that race, and I'm of this race, so we're going to define ourselves there. And 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 we're seeing today that in in a multi ethnic democracy where there's also income inequality, uh, there's there's a big stratification that even you know even if you have good leaders in the government, it may be very hard to hold. The nation uh, together, and so I guess my my hint of pessimism coming in is just given the difficulties of such a fragile and historically uh, rare system. Um, now, I would say, you know, you mentioned that you know I focus on things like geography. You focus on uh, the private sector. I think these things are also related because if you look at both Britain and the United States, the places where you've had long-standing liberal governments. They had the benefit of being essentially islands compared to the rest of the, you know, when you're Germany and you're surrounded by powerful countries, I can see why the Germans have fallen into periods of dictatorship because tensions are high. And, and when, time, when national security risks are high, governments tend to become more repressive and even fall to dictatorship. And so the United States and Britain, their geography has allowed for a more decentralized um, system. But now that we have it, we have to preserve it. And that's, that's where I really worry most about the United States. So on the pessimism, uh, one of my uh, friends gave me a great line. He said he was thinking of starting a pessimist club, but he was so convinced nobody would come. He said the hell with it. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, you know, the, I, I'm even optimistic about the divides in our country, and and that's because I've done, I've been involved in a lot of polling. Um, what we're seeing is is that we we definitely have two polarized groups on the left and on the right. But if you really look at what they represent in the overall population, it's about 8 to 10 percent. In fact, you talked a little bit about primaries in your, your first book. The, the overwhelming majority of people who are on the left or the right, they want this place to work out. And they want us to be considerate of other people. And they want us to engage uh, people to be able to be creative and innovative. The extremes on both sides, they know they can't win in a popular vote. All right. And so there's some challenges that they're creating for us, trying to block out the ability for the majority to really be able to have a say in what's going on. But overwhelmingly, the majority on both sides, uh, they want to see us be successful and they want to see people on both sides of the ledger be successful. The challenge is not giving, not amplifying those extreme groups on both sides to the level that we do today. So I agree with you about the people, but the problem is our system amplifies those those extremes. So the primary system, does. for example, right? I mean, you know, I, I agree with you that the vast majority of people in the country are, are are more moderate than is what it looks like on on the media. But the problem is they don't get to vote for moderate candidates many times just because the primary is where all of the action is. And you have these um, highly partisan voters that are highly motivated that will turn out. And so that, you know, the candidates naturally cater to that. If you had a ranked choice system, you might get um, a better outcome. And so what I, I, I just worry that the, the, uh, the, the moderate majority just doesn't get the kind of options that they want. And so they get sucked into the hyper-partisan um, system. And the problem is changing the, the electoral system requires political consensus. And so it's like a chicken and an egg problem where, you know, we need candidates that are more moderate and more willing to reach across the aisle to fix the system. But the system is systematically reducing the number of those moderate candidates and incentivizing people to, I mean, if you just look at, I mean, it's in both parties, but I really give a lot of um, criticism to the Republican Party where there's there's the extreme on that side um, in terms of the conspiracy theorizing um, and so on and so forth has just gotten so I, I never thought I would see something like this, honestly, in, in my lifetime. And it's extremely distressing and uh, concerning. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to evolve. But the, you're, what you're right on on the numbers is if you, you, know, you assume 70 percent of the people are registered to vote, assume about a third uh, are Democrat, a third are Republican. In fact, 44 percent of the public's actually registered as other or independent. So it's even less than that. But if you take that 30% by the 70%, you're talking about 20% of the people are really in either one of the two parties. And then when you say, now let's time that by the turnout in a primary election versus a general, turnout's about 35%. So now you're talking about 8, 9, 10% of the people who will actually vote there. Mm -hmm. And if you end up having a moderate candidate running and an extreme candidate running, all the extreme candidate needs to get is what 
is the equivalent of about 5 or 6% of the public to vote for them. And I can promise you, I was in one of those two parties. Those people who vote in those primaries are much, much more extreme than people who vote in the general. Giving people more choices through top two or ranked choice voting or other systems that remove the, the parties from being in power is one of my great causes. It's something that I... I believe in deeply. Some states you can do that by initiative. I think in Arizona you're going to see a uh, something on the ballot in the next two years. Uh, but we've seen it happen in Alaska and Maine. Nevada has something coming up on the ballot. There's the 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 public is beginning to understand that this is a problem and they want to change. I think for the parties to survive, I'm not sure they'll ever get it, but they need to begin to become more reflective of that great center, or they are going to go the way of the dustbins. I support everything you just said. If you're waging this uh, um, mission to try to change those electoral rules, then I'm 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 going to be uh, doing everything I can to to help uh, support it. Well, um, I, I will always be talking about that. Uh, our, our efforts called Save Democracy. But let's talk about your book for a moment. If somebody wants to get the new book that you have, uh, tell me where they would go to be able to pick it up. Uh, I think it's so I just uh, was on a, a trip to a bunch of cities and it was in uh, airport bookstores, at least for now. Um, so you can, I, I assume you can get it in most bookshops, your local bookstore. You can obviously order it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the big stock stores or the indie bookstores online. But I think right now it's still being pretty widely carried in, in most uh, bookshops. So hopefully it's in your local bookstore. All right. So danger zone. Uh, and uh, it's Professor Michael Beckley and your partner. Talk a little bit about him just for a moment. Yeah, your so on the book. Professor uh, Hal Brands, he's a historian um, at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he's one of the top historians, um, focuses mostly on Cold War history and, and great power politics. I would also say he's um, probably one of, if not the most prominent grand strategist of, of my generation. Um, he's relatively young, but he's amazingly prolific and influential. And now he's working on a fantastic project, um, looking at what sort of the history, the pre-Cold War history. So, you know, the World War II, World War I era uh, tells us about the future of great power competition um, going forward. So he's just a wonderful guy, a good friend, and really one of the, the ultimate top people in this field, um, at least of my generation. Well, I'll be interested to see what he does. And also we'll be uh, excitedly looking for your next book as well. Well, Professor Beckley, it. thanks so much for being on. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Thanks for joining the Optimistic American Show. Now help us grow by subscribing to our channel. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave a like and a comment. There is so much more that we have planned, and we can't wait for you to embark upon this journey with us.